Hello everyone. Before we start, I have a few disclaimers. This story has themes of suicide, so if you are in a bad headspace, you may not want to listen to this one. I would recommend talking to a professional, as well as friends, family, and those who care for you. Know that you are cared for, and you are not alone. Also, this story is a bit of a trip, so just be prepared for what may come. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you enjoy. Now, let's delve into the dark together. I was jolted upright by the sound of my alarm. The clock reads 6 a.m. I slam my hand dramatically on the snooze button and let out a sigh for no one to hear. Same time every morning, but it never gets easier. I've been an insomniac ever since I was a child, plagued with vivid, detailed, recurring nightmares. It's as if I live through entire days in some faraway land, only to wake up feeling drained and exhausted and ready for a good night's sleep. One I will never get. I drag myself out of bed and into the shower, getting ready for work in a dazed state, my body on autopilot. Looking in the mirror, I feel sick, seeing the lines on my face, the clear representation of how much time has passed since I've been stuck in this endless loop. The cycles of waking up, going to work, sitting behind a desk in a windowless room until the sun goes down, waiting impatiently for the day to end so I can go home alone to do nothing at all. Not too daring to think too hard about anything or to change my dismal routine for fear that to break myself out of the trance of monotony would mean being forced to face the reality of how truly miserable my existence is, how empty, how lonely. Looking away in disgust, I feed my cat and leave for work. The day drags on, they all do, but this one in particular. It's getting harder to ignore the face in the mirror, the pathetic, sad face that was once dying to be free, that has now given in to the hopeless knowledge that this is how I will live and how I will die. Day in, day out. Day in, day out. Wake up. Wait for the day to end. Restless sleep. Repeat. Exhausted. Apathetic. Hollow. This is what real depression looks like. I think to myself. I had issues with anxiety and thoughts of suicide when I was young. I was angry, frustrated, hurt, and scared. I felt overwhelmed by my emotions, trauma, and deep suffering. I felt something. There was a fight in me. Even if that fight was directed towards the wrong people at all times, even if the fear and anger destroyed any relationships I struggled to develop. I felt something. It was loud, like a constant screaming in my mind, like a caged animal trying to claw its way to freedom. This fight, this rage, this fire within me, is dead. The screaming has been replaced by a silence that is somehow louder. The dark, racing thoughts were replaced by an even darker void of thoughtlessness. The fire consumed by a cold emptiness. The defense mechanisms I created to tolerate the chaos inside of me may have worked too well. They have quelled the insanity and the rage, the fear and frustration, by hollowing myself out, by emptying my mind and draining my spirit, replacing everything I feel with a numb nothingness. Alone in the void, left to learn the hard way that that numb, quiet loneliness is worse than any pain that life can throw at you. I would kill myself if I had the energy or drive to bother. Instead, I sit on the couch and scroll through Netflix until I finally fall asleep. I am suddenly awoken, startled from another horrific nightmare. Whatever pieces are left of my soul, twisted and distorted through years of my forced repression, now monsters that haunt me any time I seek a moment of rest. 
You really can't bury the past. You can try, but it will crawl its way out of the grave to hunt you down. A much greater enemy now than it was when you buried it. In a sudden moment of impulsivity, I grabbed the sharpest knife I own and began filling the bathtub. This is how it really happens, I think to myself. Less of the drawn-out, planned scenario they show you in movies. The reason why most surviving friends and families talk of a loved one's suicide being sudden and without warning. It is hard to fight the survival instinct, ingrained deep in the primal mind of all creatures. The more time you have to think about it, the harder it will be. The guilt will creep in. The fear will take over the desire to end it. It's a moment of impulsivity, when the fire inside you, the need to be free, the soul that you drowned out through sorrow and a cold apathy towards life, finally wakes up screaming, urging you to make a move, to do something now before you fall back into the half-asleep and half-alive state of being you've grown so unfortunately accustomed to. I hold the knife to my wrist, trying to gather the courage to make sure I succeed. The last thing I want is to wake up in a hospital, everyone crying and doting over me. All the worst imaginable kind of attention for someone who lives such a solitary life. Just do it already! I screamed at the face in the mirror. Yeah, just do it! Another voice suddenly chimes in. I let out a shriek as the knife dropped to the floor. I picked it back up and turned around, holding it out into the air, an empty threat in an empty room. Who's there? I asked through a shaky, panicked voice. Who said that? Who the hell said that? Fear becoming frustrated anger as a weak attempt by my subconscious to force my body into fight mode. Go on. Do it. Kill yourself. Look at yourself, you pathetic. What do you have to live for? Just a waste of space on an overcrowded planet, one less sad sack in line at the grocery store. Do the world a favor. The voice that spoke was like none I had ever heard. Raspy and harsh, like someone who managed to live 300 years smoking a pack of Marlboros a day. <clears throat> the voice clears its throat and coughs a few times, and when it speaks again, the sound is that of a fairly high-pitched tone for a male voice with a very thick British accent. So, um, sorry I'm late, the voice said. Why don't you stop pointing the knife at me and turn it back around? Please go on. Don't stop on my account. What the actual hell? I said, my voice barely above a whisper. Who are you? How did you get into my apartment? Well, I'm not in your apartment exactly. You see, it's more like I exist in a space between worlds in a realm of total chaos, and I've honed in on your location by the beam of your existential misery, so I can sort of mess with you from the etheric plane, yada yada. I honestly don't know exactly how it works, above my pay grade. Yeah, uh, okay, right. And why are you messing with me from the etheric plane, or whatever the hell? It's my job. Right. It's your job. Yeah, I'm a demon. Ha. <laughs> Interesting line of work. Yeah, I mean, it can be. The hours are pretty chaotic, and my boss is a piece of work, but, you know... I get up every day and I push the best I can. Could be worse, of course. Could be floating around all day in the Lake of Souls or the Pit of the Damned, so I try my best to keep a positive attitude. Right. Anyway, not to rush you here, but do you think maybe you can get on with it? I was just minding my own business, having a nice nap, when next thing I knew I was hurtled through all the time and space to this location to help you along with the whole process of turning over your soul to eternal damnation, and quite frankly, I'm tired. Get on with it? Yeah, you get on with the whole killing yourself thing. Well, I mean, I was going to, but you sort of interrupted that process. And now I'm slightly more interested in the fact that there's some disembodied voice in my kitchen calling himself a demon and speaking with a cockney accent. Now don't get cheeky. I really need to meet my quota this month. I'm tired of being ridiculed day in and day out because Bill talked three teenage girls into a suicide pact and Clyde convinced an eight-year-old named Damien to kill his twin sister. 
Blah, 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 Gary whined. For crying out loud, overachievers. How hard is it to talk an eight-year-old into wanting all the attention? At least I'm willing to accept a challenge. And with that, I burst into a fit of hysterical, uncontrollable laughter. Tears that suddenly streamed down my face. Not even sure what I found so funny, but unable to stop even when I ran completely out of air. Stop there. It was so funny. The demon asked, clearly annoyed. This, all of this, it's just, it's just so ridiculous. I gotta hand it to the human survival instinct. I was so ready to end it this time. So ready. I guess my subconscious figured its last-ditch effort to keep me alive was to manufacture the hallucination of some demon who's totally terrible at his job, just to confuse me long enough to keep me from going through with it. The brain really is fascinating. I should have studied psychology. Whoa, hey, kid. Harsh. Maybe I'm not bad at my job. You're just shy at killing yourself. This made me laugh even harder. And screw you for suggesting your tiny little human brain would be able to manufacture someone as complex and clever as myself. More laughter. I'm glad you find this all so amusing, but seriously, miss, I have a quota to make. And if I lose another bet to Bill and Ted at the office, they'll never let me live it down. I'll be demoted to shit shoveler in no time. Just shoveling shit into the pile of souls day in and day out while everyone laughs at little Gary for being mediocre in life and mediocre in death as they just love to remind me. Well, that's not very nice, I said mockingly through my laughter. Yeah, go on then. Make fun of poor stupid old good-for-nothing Gary like everyone else. Oh, jeez. Sorry, Gary. I'm Anna, by the way. And I'm pretty sure you called me good-for-nothing who should do the world a favor, but I guess we'll just let that slide. Actually, I think I called you pathetic, but I told you already. I'm just doing my job, Gary said, becoming increasingly frustrated. Yeah, well, definitely not. I think I'd have to agree with Bill and Ted on this one. You may want to put in your two weeks' notice. But wait a minute. Are there really two demons in hell taking bets on your failure whose names are Bill and Ted? I asked him. There is. I immediately burst out laughing. It's not funny. They make my life a live in hell. Well, even more so than it already is. No one ever sees my potential. I'm always the butt of some half-witted joke. You're supposed to be my big win. You were Ted's one big screw-up, and I was going to be the one to get you. What are you talking about? Remember when you were like 16, you started doing a titload of drugs because you were all pissed off at life like a bratty little teenager? Yeah. Right. Well, that was Ted's influence. He saw you were depressed and in a pretty weakened state emotionally, so he started popping up in your dreams to chase you around so you wouldn't get any proper sleep. Anyway, he just figured the insomnia would drive you mad. Didn't even bank on you turning into hard drugs just to get some rest. He was quite proud of that one. Thought he had your soul in the bag, so we got complacent. Started working on another case. And by the time we got back to check on your status, you had somehow managed to clean up your act. He actually got demoted from officer manager for that one. It was hilarious. So, anyway, I thought it would be my big moment if I managed to be the one to take you down. For someone so freaking pitiful, you have a surprisingly resilient soul, unfortunately for me. Or you're just bad at your job. Well, thanks a lot. Believe me, if I could take another job, I would. This is the best I get for a demon in hell. It is still hell, after all. Sounds more interesting than my job. I mean, yeah, it probably is. So, yeah, I mean, this has been an alright little chat and all, but can you please just get on with it? The demon pleaded with Anna. I would really like to get back to my nap. I mean, sorry, dude. It was kind of on a whim. An impulsive decision. I'm not really in the mood to go through with it anymore. Damn it. Honestly, I haven't laughed that hard in years. If anything, you prevented my suicide. If the whole demon thing doesn't work out for you, you should really consider a job in counseling. Oh, you're hilarious. Oh, shit. Now what? I can't go back to hell like this. Can't face stupid Bill and Ted, not to mention I have a performance review for the big guy at the end of the month. That's gonna be rough. Gary said somberly. Sorry, Gary. Maybe if you stick around for a bit, I'll eventually change my mind. I'll be sure to give you all some credit when I get to hell. I softened my tone, surprised at the realization that I seemed to actually be hurting this demon's feelings. Well, thanks, Anna. I do appreciate it. Sure thing, buddy. 
If you want, you can keep rating me for a while. Maybe if I have a constant voice in my ear reminding me I'm a worthless cow, it'll speed up the process. Yeah, doubtful. Not even an overqualified demon such as myself could talk more shit on you than you already do. You're so mean to yourself. What could I possibly say to top it? Fair point. Let's see. You're ugly. Stupid. Nobody loves you. You're kind of short, I guess. Yeah, sorry, Gary. That's not going to cut it. Probably should have left me alone. I was already doing a pretty good job talking myself into an early grave before you came along. So, no offense, but considering you really do make a terrible demon, I have to ask, how exactly did you become one? Are demons just born that way? Was it some weird voodoo curse or something? Nice of you to ask, Anna. No one really ever asked me before how I got into this line of work. It began a long time ago when I was a boy. I used to be a human once too, believe it or not. You certainly wouldn't know by my parents, but no, we're not born this way. At least, I wasn't. Can I see what you look like? It's pretty bad. You're not gonna like it. I'm ugly as sin, literally. Oh, go on, Gary. Don't be shy. Okay. Look in the mirror. I should be able to appear to you there. I walked over to the mirror and watched intently as a figure appeared behind me. At first, just a black silhouette. It slowly began to take form. Gary was not exaggerating. I gasped in horror at the sight of it. A hideous, terrifying creature. The embodiment of evil. Its mouth full of broken and jagged teeth. Its eyes pitch black and bulging, skin peeling from its face, revealing a gruesome black oozing decay underneath where blood should have been. Holy shit, Gary. You are pretty scary looking. I know, I know. It's gross. No, no, it's, it's really not that bad. I was handsome once. Uh, kind of. Whatever. So anyway, I was going to tell you the story of how I became a demon. Right. Yeah, I'm actually pretty curious about that. Alright. Well, yeah, so. I was a boy, living in a small town in Norfolk. My dad was an asshole. My mom was alright. I had a decent childhood for the most part. All except for the ruddy turd of a neighbor I was unfortunate enough to live next to. He was called Tom. And for whatever reason, he got quite a laugh out of making my life absolutely miserable. Why? No idea, actually. Never did a single thing wrong with that kid. Guess he was just one of those assholes who got off on picking on people. Always trying to one-up, make himself feel superior. He had quite the complex, that Tom. Anyway, whenever I'd be playing in the yard trying to mind my business, enjoying myself, Tom would come over and make some sort of challenge out of whatever I was doing. Telling me I was shot and he could do it better. He'd challenge me to a race, push me to the ground midway through, and still brag in the most obnoxious way about how he'd won. That sort of push-your-buttons-hard kind of bullshit. I knew it was just stupid kid shit, but I was a kid too. And it really started to get to me. I hated him. I really did. I honestly wish I hadn't even allowed him to take up so much space in my head, but he really got under my skin, you know? Yeah, I do know. Some people just seem to think the smaller they can make you feel, the bigger and better it makes them. I told him. Yeah, that was Tom. Always belittling me as if that somehow made him the better man. It was bad, but I could deal with it. Till Sarah moved into the small farmhouse down the way. Sarah, from the moment I saw her, I loved her. She was beautiful. Blonde hair, blue eyes. Perfect. And she was kind, too. Very kind to me. We became friends instantly. We'd take long walks together, we'd talk and laugh for hours. I loved him more than anything. I was planning on asking her to marry me. Oh, she sounds cool. She really was, till Tom came along, dug his grubby little hooks into her. He made up a bunch of awful lies about me, tried to scare her off, said I used to kill the old barn cats for sport, that I was cruel to the other kids when we were young. Might as well have been describing himself when he talked about me. I don't understand why she believed him. She knew me. But he was cunning. Wormed his way into her ear and implanted himself in her head. 
She stopped talking to me, and not long after, they were married. Oh, shit, Gary. That's awful. I'm sorry. The worst part was, he didn't even love her. He didn't care about her at all. He only did it to hurt me. I never understand that. How someone can be so cruel they'll go to such great lengths just to hurt someone else. Just to come out on top. He'd parade her around, always trying to make me jealous. Rumors started around town about how he would hurt her, about how he spoke to her in public. He treated her terribly, but she stayed out of duty to the vow she had made, because that's the kind of person she was. Anyway, I tried to block it out. I was saving money to move as far away from that awful little town, away from Sarah and away from Tom. I loved to fish, so I made some extra money. I'd go out to the local pond in my little canoe and sit out there in the peaceful stillness, catch a few fish, and sell them in the market. It was nice. I enjoyed the solitude. I would drift out onto the pond in my own little world, away from anyone who could disturb me. So, of course, Tom hated that. He hated that I found something that I enjoyed, that I was good at, better than him, and he knew it. So one day, he came to me with a bet. He offered me more money than I made in a week if I could catch a larger fish than he could. I tried to refuse. I did not want Tom spoiling my happy little world on the pond, but I needed the money, and I knew I would win. I wanted to take that money and use it to make my grand exit. So I accepted. Oh, boy. Yeah. The next day we went out in my canoe. I tried to block him out as he taunted me. The sound of his voice alone was enough to make my blood boil. Shut up, Tom. I repeated to him over and over. But the more frustrated I became, the more he prodded, revealing and knowing he was getting under my skin. But he hadn't caught a single fish. I'd caught about five already. I turned the tables. I began to laugh and reminded him that for all his shit-talking, it seemed we'd found something I could do better. Something he couldn't cheat at to win like he did when we were kids. I could see he was getting angry, and this fueled a sick sense of pleasure deep inside me. At that moment, I finally understood how Tom felt at the time. That was the only sense of pleasure he knew how to derive from life. And in that brief moment of empathy, I actually pitied him. Glad that I could find peace in my heart and joy for something as simple as fishing, while all he felt was rage and a need to hurt other people to make himself feel better. But like I said... The moment was brief. And then there was a bite and a sharp tug on my line. I could tell it was a big one. It took me at least ten minutes to reel it in. It nearly tipped the boat as it tried to swim down to the safety of deep water. When I finally pulled it up, it was beautiful. A massive fish, larger than any I'd ever caught in that pond. I laughed and, of course, rubbed it in Tom's face that it was time to go home. That there was no way he could catch a larger one than that. I carefully removed the hook, getting ready to toss it back into the pond. Aren't you going to sell it on the market, Gary? Tom asked. No way. Sure, I can make some decent money off a fish that size, but this beauty deserves to be free. This big guy's been in this pond a while to get to this size. No one's managed to catch him till now. I'd let him continue breeding, so it'll be more like him in the future. For someone like me to enjoy... Because, unlike you, Tom, some of us are able to enjoy things like fishing, like the compassion of a good woman, like the warmth of the sun. Some of us can feel joy without needing to cheat and steal from others. Searing pain. Blackness. It took a moment for me to realize what had happened. Tom had punched me square in the nose. Blood was shooting out of my face, staying the size of the boat. And before I could get myself together... I watched helplessly as he bashed the life out of my beautiful catch with a half-empty bottle, laughing as he beat in the skull of that poor bastard beyond recognition. And I just snapped. Years of this torment, countless hours of mental energy wasted on my hatred of this sorry sod, and I finally snapped. I shoved him as hard as I could, and right over the side he went. The boat rocked violently, but somehow managed to stay upright as I watched him flail and panic to keep his head above the water. Help! I can't swim, Curie! Help! I reached over the side of the boat and grabbed his hand. 
Look at that. Another thing I'm better at. Swimming. I couldn't help but point out with a laugh. Go to hell, you stupid loser. He shouted at me, while sucking in water between breaths. That stupid bitch, Sarah. She would have married you, you know. I made her hate you. I told her every lie I could think of to make sure she could choose me over you. And you were too big of a coward to man up and try to win her back. You just laid down to die like the worthless waste of a man you are. Even knowing that he would drown and that I was the only one that could save his life, he still couldn't help himself. He still couldn't keep his mouth shut. Still felt the need to berate me while swallowing more and more pond water with every word he spoke. So I let go. I let go of his hand and grabbed my oar and I paddled away. His panicked screams, full of rage and hate, slowly faded behind me. I rode away with a smile on my face and I never looked back. I had never known what true contentment felt like till Tom was gone. Like a weight lifted off me, I finally, truly understood peace. But about a week later, I was trampled to death by a stampede of horses that were accidentally sprung from the corral of the neighboring farm. Figures, right? Anyway... I woke up in hell with this mess of a face, damned for an eternity, doomed to live out my biggest sin over and over, to exist in a constant state of rage, taking it out on all those tortured souls, misdirecting my own misery onto them, uh, damned to be, uh, well, Tom, basically. God definitely has a pretty messed up sense of humor. Meanwhile, stuck at the office with a whole bunch of other assholes just like Tom, just like me. Worst part being, I can't find Tom. It's been like a hundred years at least, and I can't find him down there. I swear to God, if that asshole made it to heaven. Gary, wow, I'm so sorry. That really doesn't seem fair at all. Maybe he's down in the pit? Maybe you just can't see him? Maybe you'll be shoveling shit on his face for the next hundred years? I sure do like to hope so, Anna. That's about all I have left to hope for, if I'm being honest with myself. Most likely I'll just be damned for eternity after my complete and utter failure with you. Oh man, I really am sorry. I wish there was something I could do to help. But, like, you're really not selling the whole hell thing. I'd kind of rather live out my shitty life at this point, in the hopes that maybe I'll end up somewhere else. Well, that's not fair. You probably tortured yourself enough anyway. Hell. We'll just be redundant for you at this point. A bore, really. I guess that's true. But, thanks for listening. It's been nice to have someone to talk to. Yeah, it's been nice to talk to you too, Gary. Thanks for helping me not kill myself, but again, sorry about that. Yeah, that's alright. Any other questions you want to ask an old demon before I head on back face the music? Yeah, actually. If there's a hell, that means there's a heaven, right? What exactly do I need to do to get there? Can you give me a list of requirements or something? Well, as far as I know, it works something like this. Real good people. Like, I mean, really good. The ones who somehow manage to avoid giving in to shoving people off canoes, no matter how much they suck, and who live in service to others, they go to heaven. The average Joes like yourself who don't really do much of anything noteworthy, and no offense, of course... I'll reincarnate to try it again, and the rest of us end up in hell in some form or another. I guess depending on what it is you doom Jones' soul to deserve an eternity of. Self-loathing is a sea of other helpless creatures selfishly dragging each other under while trying to pull themselves out of a pit. Or a demon stuck listening to creeps like Bill and Ted all day. Shit like that. I guess my best chance is reincarnation then. Uh, pretty sure I'm not going into heaven. Yeah, no, you're definitely not. Well, thanks for the vote of confidence. Sorry. Anyway, I guess I better get back. Could you do me a quick favor? Sure, Gary. What is it? If a demon named Ted comes around, just don't kill yourself for him, okay? I'll never hear the end of it. Fair deal, buddy. Thanks. Oh, one more thing. If you could draw a symbol in your blood on the door, it'd help me out a lot. 
It's like a three-mile hike up a jagged-ass mountain if you don't teleport directly into headquarters. That was really a pain in the ass at every turn. I picked the knife back up and made a small incision in the flesh of my forearm. With Gary's instruction, I drew the symbol on my front door. Okay, now, you just put your palm to it and repeat this phrase. Wait a minute. No offense, Gary, but you are a demon. How do you know this wasn't all some elaborate trick to gain my trust and get me to draw this weird symbol thing to open some portal to hell and start the apocalypse or something? Damn. Why didn't I think of that? That would have been a great idea. I really am bad at my job. You know, Anna, you'd make a pretty good demon. Perhaps we'll meet again someday. Uh, well, thanks, Gary. No offense, but I really hope not. Okay, well... Bye, I guess. Later, Gary. I put my hand on the door and listened to the words Gary told me to repeat. I opened my mouth to speak, but before I could, I was blinded by the most brilliant light I had ever seen. My entire apartment bathed in this light. I could see nothing else. I was forced to shield my eyes. They felt like they would burn right out of my skull. After a few seconds, I opened my eyes slowly, squinting to see the light had dimmed, but was still quite profound. And in the center of the pearly gold iridescence was a man. A beautiful man, with long brown hair, long white robes, and a pair of seriously old sandals. Holy shit. I mean, Jesus. Jesus. Hi there, friends spoke the most soothing, wonderful voice I had ever heard. The words sounded like a song, like the kind of song that would bring a grown man to tears, but also slightly resembled the voice of Ned Flanders. Um, hi. I stumbled over my words. Are you? I... The one and only, spoke the voice. Well, no, not exactly. Depending on your religion, there's a Korean Jesus, a black Jesus, the list goes on. Basically, we're just a group of hippies who tried to be nice to people and got totally wrecked for it. Uh, that's a lot. Um, why are you in my living room? Well, I was just hanging out with some friends, sharing a peace pipe with some forest creatures in heaven, when a little birdie told me there was a demon on Earth trying to talk you into killing yourself. Not cool, Gary. Gary began to cry. I... I'm so sorry. I... I truly am. Please, uh, forgive me. Well, buddy, that's my job, and I happen to actually be good at it. It's you who needs to forgive yourself. Same goes for Anna. You guys realize you've been bigger dicks to yourselves than anyone else ever has, right? The room was silent. Neither myself nor Gary could find the words. We were awestruck, consumed in the glory that filled the room. We fell to our knees and cried our desperate apologies to the godly figure that stood above us. Oh no, take it easy guys, it's all good. As far as humans and demons go, you guys are pretty alright. The man knelt down and put a hand on both of our shoulders. A feeling of true peace, of calm, warmth washed over me. I sobbed as my entire being was engulfed in a love that forced out all the pain and fear that had shacked me for so long to this miserable state of being. I felt true freedom. I finally understood, well, everything. I understood the meaning of life, of love, of being. I understood the true value of myself and of everyone else. This embodiment of truth, of unconditional love for all things, who also happens to be just a truly good person who smoked peace pipes with chipmunks and wore old sandals. Even the guilt and shame I would have otherwise felt in the face of this purity was gone, replaced with forgiveness, and for the first time I truly forgave myself. I forgave myself for all the pain and suffering I had caused. Well, myself. And then I woke up to the blaring sound of my alarm. 6 a.m. Was it all a dream? No. How? How could it all have been a dream? It was so real. I said my thoughts out loud, almost believing Gary could hear me. I began to sob, 
angry at my own mind for not allowing me to feel such peace if it wasn't real to begin with. But as I got up, I saw the dried blood on my hand and a strange symbol on the door. I looked out my window and saw a little bird came to greet me on my windowsill. It sang its sweet song as if directly to me. I smiled at the little bird, the first real smile I had felt on my face in a long time. I decided at this moment I would make it real, that I would live the rest of my life in appreciation of all the glory and wondrous joys of this world, knowing that good or bad, all things in life are just experiences to be had, that even in times of sadness I would rather be sad than be numb, and in times of frustration I would seek out the things that brought me joy and peace. I vowed to be kind to others and kind to myself. And I kept that promise. I decided to live the fullest life that I possibly could. I met a man and got married. I had three children whom I loved unconditionally. I had found a deep happiness inside myself that couldn't be broken even in the face of hard times. For years I volunteered at the local animal shelter. I had found the true sense of joy that came from living in service of others. Broken free from the cage of solitude I spent the start of my life in. I was truly fulfilled. But once in a while I would think of Gary. I would look into the mirror and say his name, waiting for his ugly face to appear, but he never did. I wondered what became of Gary. If he was shoveling shit, or if perhaps he had been promoted since then, and maybe given some bat wings and the freedom to fly around instead of having to climb jagged mountains over lakes of fire and the like. I hoped so. I wished I could thank the demon who had saved my life. I was deep in thought about Gary when a call came into the animal shelter. The blind owner of a ten-year-old service dog had passed away, and his family was bringing him in. I knew it was not likely they would find a new home for an old dog, I tried not to be angry at the family of the man who refused to care for the dog of their lost loved one in its golden years. I chose a pen for him and placed a warm blanket and some toys and treats around the cage, trying to make it as comfortable as possible. I would make sure he felt safe and cared for, loved. The dog was brought in soon after, a beautiful black lab with bright, inquisitive eyes. According to the family, he had been a wonderful service dog, incredibly intelligent, a true friend to its owner, and the only reason the man was able to live out his life safe at home instead of in some awful facility. I bit my tongue and kept myself from the, well then, why don't you have a heart and take him home with you, he's probably even more devastated than you are about the death of his owner, comment that I was dying to make. I just smiled and kept quiet. I took the dog out back allowing him some time to play in the sun before being put in his pen. He ran around for a moment, releasing excess energy, and then ran right to me. I scratched behind his ears, and he looked up at me, with that look of love the dogs are so good for, and what I believed truly looked like a content smile on his face. It felt like the greeting of an old friend. I wasn't quite sure why, but it felt as if I knew him. I had the strongest sense of deja vu I had ever experienced. His eyes looked to mine, and I felt as if the old black lab was thinking the same thing. I knelt down to continue petting him, and I noticed the tag on his collar. His name was Gary. Don't worry, Gary, I said, softly. All dogs go to heaven. <laughs>